Welcome to Ask Kalefi, the podcast that dives into real-life problems that plumbing and HVAC technicians face in the field. We're your hosts from the Kalefi Tech Support Team. I'm Greg Tubbs. And I'm Dan Furkus. Welcome. We look forward to sharing some stories from our tech calls and using our background and expertise to make your days a little easier. Hey there, welcome back to another episode of Ask Kalefi. How are we doing, Dan? Ah, we're doing good. Welcome back, everybody. So what have you been up to lately? Oh, boy. A lot of home projects lately. Yeah. Well, you got to get that honey-do list taken yeah, care of. Yeah, you know that. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's getting to be that time of year. Right. Time to get out and play around in the woods. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we got a guest today. We do. It's exciting. So you don't have to listen to just us talk to ourselves. No, no. You guys will be happy. You don't have to listen to our voices today. Well, they will have hey, to well, listen. Hey, well, a little bit. A little bit. Right, right. So who we got today? We got John Siegenthaler. Yeah, we're lucky to, and happy to have John on today. So a lot of you know John is very involved with Coffee with Cleffy. Yeah. You'll I, hear him on there. In fact, you just heard him on there uh, recently. Yeah, just a, a super talented guy, a uh, smart guy. Well, welcome, John. Well, good morning, guys. Glad to be here. Yeah, so you, you want to maybe just give give them a little bit of your background? Oh, my background. Uh, let's see. Well, my father was a carpenter, so I grew up around construction, grew up around tools, really okay. enjoy them, still do. So you grew up around uh, the job sites. Like we all do. Yeah. 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 We're doing carpentry work, actually quite a, quite a bit of different types of work not not in great detail but uh, i learned a lot that kind of came back to me when i needed it later on and then i uh, i actually went to school my background is actually in aeronautical engineering i wanted to fly jet fighters didn't have the eyesight quite good enough for that so i said well if you can't fly them let's design them went to school for aeronautical engineering oh actually that has some parallels, and quite a few parallels with hydronics, fluid mechanics, heat transfer, and so forth. Okay. And uh, I got out of college in, uh, let's see, 1978, uh, and went to work for a solar thermal company uh, in upstate New York so that was building solar collectors. So basically, I knew very little about hydronics uh, from a practical standpoint, and uh, more of a theoretical approach to fluid mechanics and heat transfer, but uh, the first uh, two or three years on the job, I learned a lot about hydronics. And again, this was circa 19, late 1970s. Okay. And the solar market was was thriving then. It actually grew very rapidly, and it also fell apart almost as rapidly when the tax credits expired in the 1980s. Okay. Yeah, I, I recall that from, you know, Kind of the late seventies, early eighties. Home was always had those old solar well, yeah, collectors. We always on would top. run into those houses on jobs where you go in there. The old collectors are on the top of the house on the roof, and an old style water heater that right. had some sort of contraption on the side. And I just remember looking and going, "Wow, look at all that!" Yeah, usually at that point yeah. it was all abandoned, but yeah, still still in place. Yeah, I actually uh, well, we built a house in nineteen eighty. We did a lot of the work ourselves, and I actually put in a solar thermal system, and it's still operating. Actually, it has some of the the uh, StarMax collectors on it right now, a uh, drain-back system that does, well, it does most of our domestic water, especially in the summer, but it also contributes to some space heating in the house. Uh, back when we built, actually, tubing wasn't available, so we used copper tubing right. for radiant floor heating, and that's all still in place, still operating. Oh, okay. Uh, but you know, as we were saying, the solar thermal market kind of fell apart, and that ended up, <laughs> I ended up being laid off from the company as a result of that, and actually ended up uh, going to a community college to do teaching in uh, mechanical technology and, and some of the engineering science courses there. I uh, spent 27 years at Mohawk Valley Community College uh, teaching. Wow. And during that time, um, got more into uh, hydronic systems. Uh, of course, radiant panel heating really starting to come back in, i say, the late 1980s and the 1990s. Uh, so new materials, new at that time, PEX tubing and so forth, uh, mixing valves and 
you know, what we take for granted today in, in the radiant market or the hydronics market. That was all relatively new back then, at least in North America. So um, actually developed a course in hydronic heating that I taught at the community college and enjoyed that a lot. And it also gave opportunity to go out and do other consulting work uh, uh, as an engineering company. We design hundreds of heating systems around hydronics, uh, pretty much any heat source that could work, we've, we've worked with it. And uh, you know, wrote a textbook. Uh, the textbook really came out of uh, the, the preparation for teaching the course at the community college. Sure. Wow, you've been... Uh, have enjoyed very much working in the industry. I, I never really strategically planned to work in this industry, but I've met a lot of great people and done a lot of uh, interesting projects over the years. And uh, that's the thing back, we've actually been doing this now for about 42 years, something like that. So I'm, I'm an old timer and I have the gray hair to show it. In the industry. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Funny. Well, well, it's an interesting background. It's, it's fun. It's, Funny how life changes from wanting to, you know, be a fighter pilot to getting into the hydronics industry, and I'm sure, I'm sure you certainly in, enjoy that. Yeah, yeah, that's quite a spectrum of uh, <laughs> of a career, but uh, no, I enjoyed it very much. I, I, it sounds like it. I mean, you, you're very compassionate about it. And for us, I mean, we we ran did a lot of service work and and install, and I mean. Even doing that will give you plenty of gray hair. If you're like Dan, you have no hair left at all. <laughs> yeah, so. I pulled all mine out. <laughs> well, you know, getting out in the field, I mean, we've done some work. Uh, you know, I, I haven't actually hired myself out as a heating contractor per se, but we've done work where we've gone in and diagnosed systems and actually turned wrenches to help correct those right. systems. Guys, I would encourage anybody that's getting into engineering today, uh, especially if they're looking at HVAC as a, as a career, to get a, at least a summer job working with a mechanical contractor and, and really see what's involved in putting hardware together. Um, you know, you'll definitely see things that will help you in the design process later on. Yeah, I agree with that. You know, I 100%. I've, yeah, I mean, being coming out of the industry and out of the field, um, and at one point, you know, I did a sales and system design, you know, I did a lot of system design for hydronic and geothermal systems. And I, and I worked with engineers closely and I know the engineers that I worked with that had some field background, we were just able to talk at a whole different level and communicate at a whole different level. And it made designing the project, um, a lot easier. And actually, you know, made, made a lot of good friendships that way because you're able to communicate at a different level because, you know, I don't have the engineering experience. I have a lot of system design experience, um, but I'm not an engineer. I'm more of an install and service tech. And them having that, some of that background just made made it far easier for us to communicate and make, make the projects more successful. Yes. Yeah, um, you know, Working in the field and seeing what what happens, uh, sometimes good, hopefully most of the time good, but sometimes it doesn't go the way you plan. It's very humbling, and uh, there are engineers that could use more humbling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, no, so that I think that's great advice. I think that's certainly great advice. Well, speaking of putting hands on different parts of the system and the hardware, we're going to actually swing into talking about heat exchangers today with yeah. you, John. Yeah, you just did You just um, did the coffee with Kalefi on heat exchangers for us, so we thought, you know what, would be good to kind of parlay off of that and um, talk about, you know, talk about heat exchangers. Yeah, yeah, it's a good topic. It's, uh, it's certainly a broad topic, uh, and Hydronics 29 has also got a lot of good material on heat exchangers for it does. Hydronic, hydronic and plumbing applications. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly does. I mean, there's so many different types of heat exchangers out there, and they all have, you know, sim similar, I mean, similar use. They're, you know, exchanging heat, but different applications for them. Yeah. Um, you know, 
in, in the Iconics, uh, and as well as the, uh, the coffee with Kalefi, we, we categorize heat exchangers, basically three types. There's a uh, shell and tube heat exchanger, there's a shell and coil heat exchangers, and then there's flat plate heat exchangers. Right. And, uh, the, the common one in industrial or large hydronic systems typically has been the, the shell and tube design. These have been around for decades, and they basically came out of an era when, uh, if they were being applied, especially in industrial applications, they were up, in some cases, several hundred degrees Fahrenheit temperatures, uh, you know, not just water, but they might have been working with cooling oil in some kind of an industrial process, and, and also operating at relatively high pressure. So... Yeah, they're they're out there, and they still are. There's several companies that have those available, but they are large and they are pretty heavy. And you know, the fact that they're large and heavy means there's a lot of material in them, and of course that adds to their cost. It adds to their size. Um, so, in the context of residential and light commercial hydraulic applications, they aren't used that much these days. Um, yeah, guys, in, in residential light commercial hydronic applications, um, the tube and shell, or I'm sorry, shell and tube is the correct way to say that, that heat exchanger design doesn't get a lot of use today. And it's primarily because of size and cost in comparison to all other alternatives, more, uh, I'll say, contemporary alternatives. And the flat plate heat exchanger really has become dominant in the HVAC industry now. Um, again, within the temperatures and pressures that most hydronic systems are working at, right. uh, a flat plate heat exchanger can easily be applied. Yeah, I think and, I think in in the past when I used the shell and tube, it was when we were using a boiler to heat a pool. I think sure. that was the exchange for a pool or a spa where we used the shell and tube. Heat exchanger. Yeah, that might have been an application where the tubes that were carrying the pool water, they, they might have been a titanium or a titanium alloy with stainless steel uh, so they can withstand the, the chlorination of the pool. Right. Yeah. yeah, I think that was the only application where I've, I've ever used that. Okay. So the, the flat plate heat exchangers today, uh, again, in, in smaller systems, residential light commercial systems, normally it's going to be a brazed plate design where stack up stainless steel plates that have been uh, basically uh, stamped to a pattern that creates good turbulence in the flow, good heat transfer mm -hmm. characteristics. And then these plates are stacked up and they're braised together, both uh, uh, internally as well as around the perimeter. And so you get a unit that is completely sealed, pressure tested, and they're available anywhere from really small units down to like three inches by eight inches, maybe an inch thick, right, uh, right up to uh, a large brace plate would be probably 10 inches wide, 20 inches tall, and it might have 50 or 60 plates deep in the stack. Uh, and, a, you know, a large one like that under the right conditions could easily do multiple millions of BTUs per hour uh, transfer rate. Right. Yeah, th th I think that was more common to what we used in the field. Absolutely. I, I saw quite a few more of those yeah. in the field than I did any other type. Yeah, I think when we used them a lot, and we, Greg and I both have more of a residential background. I mean, I know we used to use them a lot for hydronic systems when we would add a garage and do the yeah. garage heating where so that allowed and us to put antifreeze in the garage floor right. and floor, run straight water in the home. To, or if you get... Somebody that really has a lot of money and wants to do snow melt. Yep, correct. I see them quite often there. Yep, uh, snow melt and garage floor heating, two common applications. Um, they can be used for domestic water heating as well. That's that's done quite a bit in Europe. Uh, we don't see it quite as much at this point in North America, but it's not because it doesn't work. It's simply because we, the hydronics industry in, in the smaller system niche of the market has gravitated more towards indirect tank type water heaters with internal coils, which again is another type of heat exchanger. But one of the, the really important distinctions between internal versus external heat exchangers, uh, 
it has to do with the rate of heat transfer. It's, it's called convection coefficient. And, and basically what a convection coefficient is, it's an indication of how well the heat can leave a surface. Or if, if it's water that's heating a surface, how well heat will transfer from the water mm-hmm. to the surface. Right. And the higher the numbers for the convection coefficient, the better that is. And when you have an internal heat exchanger, uh, think about a standard indirect tank for domestic water heating, you're pumping boiler water through the inside of that coil. The fact that you're using a pump or circulator to move that water, you have what's called forced convection. You have water moving through there at a a condition that is uh, pretty much assuring its turbulent flow. And that's really good from a heat transfer standpoint. Turbulent flow is very desirable because um, it it actually brings up the convection coefficient substantially. Now, on the other side of that coil, imagine the exterior surface of that coil where the domestic water is in contact with it. There's no pump. There's no. There's nothing pushing that water across that surface. Right. That's natural convection, and it's a much weaker phenomena compared to forced convection. So with an indirect tank or really any kind of an internal coil heat exchanger, the limitation in, is, is very much dependent on that natural convection on that tank side of the coil. That can be the bottleneck. And, and quite honestly, that is something that contractors, installers, you, you really want to be aware of that because, uh, for example, if, if a tank that was uh, a customary design, it might have, uh, oh, anywhere from six to eight coils, helical, you know, turns on that internal coil. Uh, when you look at the ratings on those coils, they often will rate it with the boiler water at either 180 or 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So they're, they're rating it under assumed conditions of a very high temperature heat source. And you can get pretty good rates of heat transfer when you have water at that temperature heating domestic water that might, especially in the bottom of the tank, might only be at 80, you know, 90 degrees. So you have a really high delta T between the water that's giving up the heat and the water that's accepting the heat. But if you take a tank like that and just try to apply it with a heat pump, that's going to be a major problem. Oh, it is. Now you only have water at maybe 120 degrees going through that coil, and you have much lower delta T and much lower rates of heat transfer. And typically what's going to happen there is because the coil can't dump the heat into the domestic water as fast as the heat pump is producing heat. The water in that circuit between the heat pump and the coil, the temperature goes up quickly and eventually there's a safety, either a high pressure switch or in some cases on the temperature. But something's going to shut that heat pump off before you damage the compressor, Um, some kind of an internal safety. And and that's just going to, you know, if it locks out the heat pump, you're going to have to reset it. And the same thing's just going to repeat. So it's definitely something to be aware of if you're out there thinking about putting in some heat pumps. And this could be geothermal water-to-water heat pumps. It could be air-to-water heat pumps. But you really want to be cognizant of that limitation on heat transfer in a standard indirect. That's where actually going back to a a brace plate heat exchanger, now you have a pump on both sides. You have uh, pumping heat between the heat pump and the heat exchanger, uh, what I call the primary side of the heat exchanger. But you have another pump between the tank and the secondary side of the heat exchanger, so you have much higher convection coefficient than on the order of easily 10 to 12 times higher rates of heat transfer with the same temperatures. And that, you know, in my opinion, that is definitely a a preferred approach because right now uh, there aren't a lot of indirect tanks on the market that have really large internal coil. You'll find these in the European market, but the North American market uh, just has not produced a lot of products that really are ideal for use with uh, an indirect tank product that's ideal for use with a uh, with a heat pump. Right. Yeah, I know with the heat pump, like you said, you're, you're working with a lot lower source temperature. So, yeah, your recovery is quicker. But also talking about, about heat exchangers and heat pumps, um, 
I did, we did a lot with geothermal water to water. And now, you know, you have the air to water, uh, coming out. Another heat exchanger used that, uh, that I saw quite a bit was that coax heat exchanger in those yep. water to water units. Yep. That's common. Uh, it's a common, uh, design. Uh, it's actually a tube within a tube, then it's all coiled up. So it fits into a small area. Uh, but a coaxial uh, heat exchanger commonly used when, when you're transferring heat between either water or a water solution with antifreeze and a refrigerant. Right. So, like, Dan, in those water-to-water units, you've got two heat exchangers in there. Um, you know, one doing the earth loop, basically transferring heat from the fluid in the earth loop to the refrigerant on the evaporator side of the pump when you're in heating mode. And then the other one is acting as your condenser, dumping heat to from the refrigerant into the water that's going to go heat the building. Yep, those, I recall that. It was always refrigerant to water heat transfer in those. Yep, and oftentimes you'll find those coils. Uh, they're all wrapped up with uh, some type of elastomeric foam insulation. So when they're operating at subdue point temperatures, they're not, you know, they're not covered with condensation. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting. So, you know, Cluffy doesn't make heat exchangers. No, we you don't know, at all. We make a, a lot of, you know, plumbing and hydronic components. One question I get quite a bit from guys calling in is, you know, can I use a hydraulic separator to control temperature from one side of the system to the other? And and I always expect, you know, well, it's not really a heat exchanger. Yeah, even though so, people look at it and go, well, it looks like it's a heat exchanger, you know, because it's round and it's got... Four, four ports, ports coming yeah. through it. Yeah. But then you kind of got to talk them off the ledge a little bit and go, look, it's not exactly what it is. But yeah. No, it really isn't intended, uh, you know, as a temperature control device. But that being said, uh, I'm thinking if you picture a hydraulic separator and you've got a modulating boiler or maybe even multiple modulating boilers on, on the source side uh, of that hydraulic separator, and then you have loads on the other side maybe zones or, you know, different types of loads. Um, when you're controlling the firing rate of those boilers, you always want to make sure that the sensor uh, that is giving feedback to that boiler is on the outlet of that hydraulic separator, not, not on the pipe that comes from the boilers into the hydraulic separator, but on the outlet. And I, I would ideally put it in a well, put it, you know, several pipe diameters down. Uh, and the reason for that is when you have zoning going on or you have multiple loads, whether it's zone valves that are opening and closing or circulators that are turning on and off, it, it, the flow, the flow rate going through or coming into the uh, load side of the hydraulic separator is going to vary. And so is the temperature. You know, for example, maybe I just turn on a zone that hasn't been on for several hours. I've got relatively cool water coming back and as that hits the hydraulic separator and, and you know it, it's definitely cooler so um you, you can actually regulate your boiler output by measuring downstream of the hydraulic separator if you have you know modulating modulation capability in the boilers or again if it's a multiple boiler system or for that matter multiple heat pumps um Basically, same concepts that we use with multiple boiler systems today would also apply to, for example, multiple water-to-water geo heat pumps or multiple air-to-water uh, heat pumps. Uh, and we're seeing both those types of heat pumps today coming uh, now with inverter compressors. So they, they have modulation capability down to, oh, roughly 30 to 40 percent of their full output. So... Uh, yeah, you you can indirectly control the water temperature going through your load through a hydraulic separator. But to your point, guys, it, it really isn't designed specifically for that function. Uh, it can it can serve as I guess I, I would I I would say you know we're using it primarily to separate the, the flow dynamics of. Right boiler pump from the load pump or, you know, multiple pumps on each side of the separator. And it also can do a really good job with air separation and dirt separation and magnetic particle separation. Uh, that's a primary intent of that device. But 
with that sensor on the output side and with feedback to the boiler, um, you know, you can achieve the temperature that you're trying to on the outlet of the separator in, in effect, uh, you know, by modulation modulating the, uh, the boiler system. Right. Well, that's, you know, with the advantages we have today with variable speed pumps and modulating, you know, modulating boilers There's and, a lot to play with you know, there. Ver- inverter compressors. I mean, you have a lot more control and flexibility than you would have had years ago with the, with, you know, the mid efficient single stage boilers and fixed speed pumps. You just, you can get a system more refined. You can do a lot more yeah. with it. Yeah, we, we have been asked, and I suspect you guys probably get this question too, you know, can I use a high, uh, heat exchanger in place of a hydraulic separator? Oh, yeah, we, yeah, get, we do that, get that. Yeah, and, and, uh, vice and yeah, versa. you know, you can, but think about uh, it doesn't, you know, the heat exchanger really isn't designed for air separation or for dirt separation. Um, so you're not getting those functions. You're going to have to add that functionality with other components. And unless there's some reason you're trying to separate the fluid that are on the boiler side of the system from the load side of the system, uh, at, at, you know, where you want absolutely no contact between those fluids, there's really no reason to separate, to use a heat exchanger there. It probably would be more expensive uh, than a hydraulic separator. And the, the other thing is, anytime you put a heat exchanger in, you have to have a temperature difference to drive heat through it. So what that would do, uh, let's say we're trying to achieve, I'm just picking a number here, I'm trying to achieve 100 degree water on my load side, I'd probably need to have at least 105, 110, depending on the sizing of the heat exchanger. I definitely need to have a higher water temperature on the source side of that heat exchanger. And if that's a heat pump or even if it's a modulating condensing boiler, that's forcing the boiler to operate at, or whatever the heat source is, it's forcing it to operate at a higher temperature. And that takes the efficiency down. Yeah, so exa- that's, yeah exactly. That's, that's kind of where my thought went when you start looking at elevating your source temperature to mix down for your load. I mean, that it's inefficient or less efficient is, to do that. It, it is with modern sources, you know, in, in, Days past when we were running boilers at 160, 180, 200 degrees Fahrenheit, you, you really didn't get much of a change in efficiency. But today, it really to squeeze the best efficiency out of either a heat pump or a ModCon boiler, you want to keep that water temperature as low as possible. And you know this kind of comes back to sizing heat exchangers. If you're if you are working with heat exchangers in systems with these contemporary heat sources. Uh, you want to have a pretty small, what we call approach temperature difference. And and that's a pretty simple idea. It's the difference between the incoming fluid that is bringing the heat to the heat exchanger and the leaving fluid that is carrying that heat to the load. And uh, I usually suggest nothing more than a 5-degree Fahrenheit uh, under full rate of heat transfer. In other words, you look at what your maximum output is on your heat source and you want to push that through the heat exchanger with no more than a five degree temperature difference between that incoming fluid from the heat source and the leaving fluid going to the load. So, you know, that minimizes that what we call a thermal penalty associated with having a heat exchanger. Right. You get more of a direct exchange across that heat exchanger. Right. You're, you know, the a hypothetical perfect heat exchanger would have a zero degree approach temperature difference. So, you could send 100 degree water in from a, from a heat source, and you could have 100 degree water going to the load. Well, in theory, that needs an infinite surface area to do that. So it, it, you can't do it from a practical or a cost standpoint. But there are applications today with flat plate heat exchangers where they're actually running at about a two degree Fahrenheit approach temperature difference, um, and that's that's good from the standpoint of heat source efficiency. But the caveat is. What's it cost you to do that? Um, right. So, yeah, you look at your heat exchanger sizing just to achieve that. There's yeah. added cost and, there. So, if you're gonna, if you're trying to go from a five degree approach temperature difference to a two, and it's adding a thousand dollars to the project, <laughs> it's probably not going to have a reasonable return on investment to do that. 
Right, right. Yeah, sizing's a, a, a pretty important thing when it comes to anything. You know, I feel in, in any project, you know. It, it is. And, you know, the good news about sizing today, most of the companies that sell heat exchangers have sizing software that's available to designers or engineers. Most of, most of it's free. Um, you know, you can go online and either download the software or you can use it directly online. And you can basically put in what I call the what if condition. You know, what, what if my source water is at 120 degrees and I want my load water to be at 110 and, you know, put in the flow rate and it will size heat exchangers based on those inputs and it'll actually check things like you know if you're trying to inadvertently say i'm trying to move 200,000 dqs per hour into the heat exchanger but i'm only taking 190,000 out well that's really that's impossible you, you have to have a heat balance across the heat exchanger uh so it'll identify those conditions and tell you basically you know you're you're over specifying the operating conditions you need to uh, that, you know, either um, reduce the number of inputs you have or let the software actually work out the solution for you. And the nice thing about doing that, there are some really intense calculations. If you look at it theoretically, you could do this by hand with a calculator, but it would take you hours to go through the iterations that you can do in a few minutes with this online software. So I use it quite a bit anytime I'm sizing up the heat exchanger. Yeah, well, that's a, it's an important tool because you're right, oversizing a heat exchanger adds a lot of cost, and obviously undersizing it is going to get you in trouble. And Greg and I have come out of the service side, so we don't like to be in trouble. No, not if we can <laughs> so, help it. Yeah, that's certainly important. But, no, this is great. I mean, it was nice to, to get on and, and talk about the different types of heat exchangers and design and and sizing. Yeah. You know, another, uh, another point too, um, to get good and maintain good transfer. I mean, a heat exchanger is not really a component that is going to wear out. Um, you know, like, like a boiler, uh, eventually a boiler succumbs, you know, on a combustion side or whatever, but a heat exchanger that's properly maintained can last for, for decades. Uh, assuming, you know, you've got, most of these heat exchangers today, uh, the flat plates are 316 or 304 stainless. So you've got a very corrosion-resistant material to begin with. Um, but keeping dirt and debris out of those heat exchangers is especially important with flat plates because they have pretty small, narrow passages. They basically pack a lot of heat transfer surface area into a pretty small package compared to let's say, a shell and tube heat exchanger. So uh, you don't want solder balls, you don't want Teflon tape, you don't want whatever crud might be in, you know, in the system because you haven't either properly flushed it out or you, know, you don't have a dirt separation function in the system. Um, it, it's important to uh, always filter upstream of, I, I like to install the dirt separation upstream of not only the heat exchanger, but also the circulator that pumps the flow through the heat exchanger. And yep. we, we show some details on that in Hydronics 29. Sure. Between that and fluid quality, you know, if you're, you got hard water, even if it's made of stainless, yep. you're still going to have problems there. Yeah. So water, yep. water quality and good uh, dirt separation is important. For sure, water quality in a closed loop system. I, I know you, you know, you've done uh, conversations with with Mark on that, and we've, you know, we've got. Uh, I forgot which hydronics it is, but we deal with water quality quite a bit. Um, and one of the things that that I have asked um, sometimes it's, it's kind of a pushback against the use of brace plate heat exchangers in domestic hot water. Uh, somebody will say, well, if I have hard water, I'm going to scale up that heat exchanger. And they're right. Yeah. Absolutely. But you're going to scale up any heat exchanging device if you have hard water. So if you think that using an indirect tank is somehow going to protect you against that without dealing with the hardness of the water, um, you, you're going to be very mistaken. Yeah. Uh, what will with those uh, indirect tanks 
you have hard water. Uh, and again, uh, these, these problems are actually made worse by high water temperatures coming into the coil. So I was let's say we have just going to say that. I was just going to say that. Oh, uh, a high source temperature. A high source temperature. So yeah. not, yep. not to the interrupt you too much. Yeah, it, it, it's, you're right at the source in, in a tankless water heater. Yep. So let's is, say we're, yeah. we're putting 200 degree water from the boiler through the coil. On the other side of that coil, we got domestic water with, you know, high, high, uh, the total dissolved solids. That's just going to play it out on the external surface of that coil. So the performance of that coil is going to go down steadily. And the more it operates, the more scale you're going to build. And eventually, even though the coil isn't leaking, you put so much scaled up material on the domestic water side of that coil and you have no way to clean it. That's, that's the other important factor. There's no way you can go in there and, and effectively clean that coil. So at that point, that whole tank is basically toast. Right. Uh, with a braze plate, you can set up valving. And it's very similar to the valving that's been used today to clean tankless water heaters. It's basically two uh, dual-function purging valves where you, you would isolate the domestic water side of the heat exchanger and then you would hook up some hoses and a sump pump and probably a mild acid solution. I'm not sure if it's a citric acid or, or what, what the chemistry of the acid is. It's not a highly aggressive acid. But basically, you're circulating an acid water solution through the domestic side of that brace plate heat exchanger. And you're, you're reacting with the alkaline materials, calcium scale, magnesium scale, and you're hopefully going to remove most of that. Uh, so you can do a pretty effective cleaning of a brace plate heat exchanger if you install the valving that you need. And there are several companies that make kits. Basically, it's a five-gallon pail, a little sump mm-hmm. pump, and some hoses, uh, and, uh, and, and a solution that you would pump through the heat exchanger. And then once you've cleaned it, uh, basically just flush it out with water, open those valves back up in your back, back in operation. So I actually think a brace plate heat exchanger in a situation like that has the advantage that it can be cleaned actually on both sides if necessary, whereas a, an internal coil in a tank, you really can't clean the domestic water side of it. Yeah, no, there's no way you'd get in there to clean that. Um, but bottom line is I tell people, look, at, if you've got hard water, you're going to scale anything. So, you know, the, the argument of I have hard water, therefore I shouldn't use a brace plate heat exchanger for domestic water heating. It's kind of <laughs> <laughs> right. It, it's really, you know, it it, it isn't a, a good logical argument because ultimately you've got to treat that water, or you know, any heat exchanger is going to eventually fail. Yeah, because so. at that point, whether it's a storage t- uh, conventional tank style storage tank, uh, indirect uh, tankless water heater. What, if you've got hard water, it's going to affect any of those products. It does. Yeah. Boy, I think we covered yeah. heat exchangers really well. Yeah. And, and then I, some. And so. I think if you guys want to learn more, remember, uh, John just did our Coffee with Cleffy on heat exchangers. That's available on our YouTube channel. And then we've got Hydronics 29 coming out on, or out on heat exchangers. Yeah. So go check that out. John, thanks for joining us. We totally appreciate it. Yeah, I look forward to uh, seeing you guys at some point. Thank you for tuning in. If you ever need help, please feel free to contact our tech support team anytime at techsupport.us at com, Or call us during our business hours at 7.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Central Time at 414-238-2360.